Okay, I guess let's go ahead and get started because we're going to have a lot to cover here. Um, I'm barely going to be able to fit this into an hour, but uh, hopefully it'll keep your attention and all that. We'll start with a couple of quick introductions. So my name is Lance Gleason. Um, I've got a small consultancy called Polyglot Programming. We do everything from wearable development to mobile development, a bit of JavaScript, and um, have a bit of history in the Ruby community as well. Also happen to be an organizer of Ruby Fuso, which is one of the biggest uh, Ruby developers conferences in Africa of all places. And it's actually going to be this February, so if you're interested in going down and actually uh, going to where it's warm, you should come talk to me about maybe coming down. And also an organizer in RubyDCamps.a, which is um, a unconference for Ruby developers. So even though we do a lot of wearable development in other languages and stuff like that, we still love Ruby a lot because the Ruby community is great. So question for everybody here, though. <coughs> How many people here have heard of um, extreme programming before? Okay, a decent number. How about pair programming? Okay, and out of that group, how many of you regularly practice pair programming in some fashion? Okay, a decent number. Well, one, a few years ago, we ran into a problem with this because we um, were a very small team, you know, very boutique style type of organization, and. Um, we have, like, sometimes, you know, we basically don't have a lot of team members, and sometimes we don't have enough budget or people to be able to pair a program. So what do you do when you want to get the benefits of pair programming, but you don't have budget or something else like that? Well, so I was thinking about that one day, and then I looked over and I saw this. How many of you have cats? Eh, a couple, right? You know, and I thought, thought about something. So... Since the time Ellie was a kitten, she was, in, she was really into electronics. She would sleep on my laptop. She would sleep in the laptop case. And I wondered, what if we maybe expanded extreme programming to the next level and substituted a human dev pair with a feline dev pair and called it per programming? So here we are getting ready for the session. Here, you know, we're doing the standard things that you need to do, best practices, where we've got one keyboard, plenty of monitors, comfortable chair for both dev pairs. And we found out a few things, you know, including you know, basically, it's a great way to take care of stress, for example, when you're working with a feline dev pair, because unlike a human, you can actually reach over and pet your dev pair when you're really stressed out, and, you know, they're going to basically, they're going to purr and it calms you down, which I don't know many human dev pairs you could do that with. And, you know, it's, it's been quite an interesting experience, and I talk about this with people, and they'll, they'll say things like, oh, it's like rubber duck programming, and I'm like, no, she drives, um, and her code runs. This was actually this morning. I was doing some final work on the presentation, and she was right there helping me. <laughs> Close up. <laughs> ready to go with the mouse, ready to correct anything. So definitely something to try. Um, for those that have dogs, we basically... How many people here are dog people? Okay, some more dog people. We've tried canine coding, but we've got cheeses, and I don't know, their motivation level hasn't been great. I mean, our one dog, Max, there, he just, like, just basically goes on to Reddit. Ming sits over here, and she's really the alpha. The cat's always the alpha when you have them. Um, but definitely something to try. We've got a website for it, um, and I've blogged about it and stuff like that, too. So there's perprogramming.com. And, you know, I think one of the biggest things, though, in general is, I mean, this is why we do this. So I work hard, basically, to make a better life for my cat. <laughs> um, but we're, obviously, we're not here to talk about cats, even though cats are awesome. And, I mean, trading pictures of cats on the Internet is really the whole purpose of the Internet and why we have it. Um, we're here to talk about wearables. So, what's interesting about wearables usually is that when you think about this usually, right, we, when we think about developing software even in JavaScript, right, we're used to, you know, you, you hear about wearable devices, and we're used to developing for things like this. So, you know, some sort of a computer, you know, a laptop, maybe a desktop, or maybe a mobile phone interface, right? You know, we're writing something that's just basically you're going to you're going to make it mobile friendly in a web interface or something else like that. So you're developing applications for this, but yet when you're getting into wearables, you're dealing with devices that look a lot more like this. You have all these crazy interfaces, and you're dealing with hardware. But here's the problem, right? This is what I operate in on a day-to-day -day basis, and probably, I mean, is anybody in this room, does anybody in this room really do anything with hardware? No. See, everybody here is also, we're, we're all software people, so if you're a Ruby developer, you're going to be doing some Ruby development. If you're an Android developer, you might be coding, you know, Java, or maybe Kotlin if you're one of the cooler kids, um, JavaScript, and some Swift and iOS and that kind of thing. 
So, you know, what are our options? What are things that we can use to start to prototype these wearable devices? Well, we do have some options. Um, a few, you know, one of them that's out there is you could use something like Link at One. The Link at One is kind of cool because it's basically, it's an Arduino form factor. Let me show you one here, just so you can kind of get an idea, or at least something that's similar in size. So you're talking about basically, I don't actually happen to have a Link at One. However, I've got an Arduino Micro, which is basically the same thing. So you're talking about a device here, and hopefully everybody can see this. It's about, you know, compared to, this is an iPhone 6S, um, basically, plus. And right there is an Arduino, which is roughly about the size of a Link at One. So it's a decent sized board. Now that is something though that you could start off with. Now how many people here have done some sort of Arduino type of coding before? Okay, so a few people have done it, right? So a link at one may be great from that standpoint because it's extensible, it, you can use Arduino code on it. That's basically how you write code for it. And it has common pinouts that you're used to. And it also does have a few extra sensors that the normal Arduino boards don't have. They give you, I think they give you like an accelerometer, a GPS, a Bluetooth radio, and a Wi-Fi radio, and some stuff like that. Um, you know, so it's not bad out of the box, but they're expensive. They're like 80 bucks. <clears throat> the problem is, though, it's pretty much impossible to create a wearable prototype with that board. I mean, if you're looking at this here, you've got basically, if you have an Arduino board with these things that are up, that's gonna be kind of difficult to create something you're gonna wear that's at all gonna be like how you'd want a device to be. And many of the, many of the um, basically the boards that you could put on top of it, the Arduino um, expansion boards are in essence overkill for what you need. And they're also gonna be way too big. But it's something to play around with and it's not bad. And not to mention, you also still are dealing with some, another problem, which is you are going to have to write your own protocol. You, it'll give you, they basically give you the drivers to interact with the Bluetooth radio or the Wi-Fi, but you're going to have to create your entire set of protocols as far as, okay, now I'm interacting with the sensor, and how do I then communicate that up via an API, and that's before you develop your app. All right, so that's another option. Well, we could use uh, something, that, so this is what you call basically an Arduino lily pad. How many people have heard of or seen this before? Okay, so a few. And they're not a bad little device. So let me just show you to give you an idea of how big they are, because this one I actually do have. So if we come back over to our handy dandy camera here. So just kind of for reference, so iPhone 6 Plus, so sorry, iPhone 6 Plus, lily pad, and Arduino Uno. This is the lily pad right here. I just haven't taken it off the board. I actually haven't done anything with this one yet. Um, it's sm so as you can see, it's a little bit smaller. Right, so you know, what's great about that board? Well, for one thing, they're a lot less expensive than the Lincoln one. You're talking about you know, maybe, I think it's like 25, 30 bucks for one, give or take, and then obviously whatever you're gonna put in, get sensors and things like that. Um, it does, you know, you can add a GPS module if you want to, so it's not like you're sitting there going, well, no, I don't have certain modules I want, because you can add pretty much anything you want to it that's Arduino compatible, though you probably don't want to use something that has a shield configuration, because that would be kind of clunky. Um, they are low power, like a lot of our, like pretty much the entire Arduino ecosystem is, which is one of the reasons, too, you're dealing with very low amounts of memory, different things like that. Um, and so you have a lot of support. Problem with this board though is one, for example, the one big issue is that if you want to add Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, again, you're going to have to get a module for it, you're going to have to integrate that into your sketch, and then you're going to have to implement the entire stack for it. And that's kind of annoying and a bit of work. Um, which basically leads you to the other thing, which is for the most part to program it, you're going to have to have a physical connection to the device, and unless you add one of these external components, if you want to get data to and from the board, you are going to have to have a physical connection. So it's kind of annoying. And pretty much all that you get with a lily pad is the board and the controller. There are no sensors on that board whatsoever. So you want to have a light sensor, you're going to have to add it. You want to have a temperature sensor, you're going to have to add it, um, accelerometer, et cetera, et cetera. 
All right, well, another thing that you could use then, and we're still in the Arduino world, mind you, is the um, Spark Core. So how many people here have heard of the Spark Core before? These things are awesome. Um, one of my first Arduino projects I did, I ended up doing a, using a Spark Core with because it's, for the, the amount of money you spend on the device, it's got some nice integrated features. Um, it's got more memory than a standard, like Arduino, Uno, that, and then adding that with the uh, Bluetooth module thing you can get, or the Wi-Fi module, I should say. Um, the new generation also actually does have a GSM slot and GSM radio in it. So you've got a SIM slot there and you can basically add connectivity that will go basically without, you, know, with, you can basically connect to the internet without having to go through a local Wi-Fi network, which is kind of cool. Um, yet you're still using basically Arduino code. The only negative of it is that you are, it does have an ARM processor and most Arduino boards are still in the mega chipset, so you'll have to recompile some drivers and things like that to get it to work correctly. But the ease of use and also just playing around with it when you first get them where they give you a cloud interface is really cool. And there was a great example of somebody that did an awesome wearable application for this where, um, how many people here have heard of war diving before? Okay, war diving is basically where you're, in essence, um, going around and trying to find open Wi-Fi networks. And then from there, you might later on decide, you know, you're going to either hack them or if you're going to be a black hat or if you're going to be a white hat, you could say, hey, you've got an open network. You should close that up and, or you should add security or something. And so this guy was basically trying to figure out, he wanted to be able to war dive in his neighborhood to find open networks, have a GPS module and war dive just to find, you know, where those units were and where the, where the open networks were. But he said, I don't want to walk around to do this, but I want to create a device that will do it. He took a Spark Core, wrote some custom firmware with it, got into the Wi-Fi radio, and then this is what he came up with. It's fairly small. He's got basically, so, a little battery there, the GPS unit, the Spark Core somewhere in there, and then this thing right here, nice compact thing so that somebody could wear it. And then he said, so who should wear this and take it around to look for networks? <laughs> His cat. <laughs> Animals are great, especially cats are great for testing wearable devices. Now you might say, well, what, that's not ethical. Well, it actually, the cat wasn't harmed. He loves his cat very much, but the cat was great. Just put the wearable on the cat and then the cat will take it around. We did that with Bluetooth devices when we were testing beacons at one point. We had stationary sensors and we were testing where this device that could see where people were in a room and stuff like that with beacons. And so I put the beacon on my cat and then had her walk around while... <laughs> It's a great way to do it, and then you can do long-term tests. That brings us to the board we're going to talk about today, which is the Metaware. All right. So what's the difference with it, and why is it so cool? Well, let me just show you here. Come back to our camera. Okay. That's a lily pad again. That is the Metaware. So we're getting a little bit of reflection. Let me just turn down that exposure slightly. Right, so, wow, that is getting glare because we've got a lot of silver on there. Okay, lily pad, metaware. <laughs> okay, so the first thing you notice right off the bat, obviously, is they are extremely small, which is cool, right? And yet, out of the box, it's got Bluetooth support. It's got a robust API for both Android and iOS. And actually now they also have a C++ library, so they're beginning to support Windows phones and things like that too, but that's a little bit, it's still a little bit early in the days for it, but they are starting to support that as well. And if you're really good at hacking in with uh, Blue Z libraries and things like that, they've actually, you can compile that down and use it with like a, basically, um, you know, an Android, or sorry, a Linux based setup with it, which I haven't done yet, but you can. Um, there are three different models that they sell right now, and they've got another one in the works. Um, the base model basically has, um, and that's like a, like a $30 retail, and if you get them at quantity, you can get them cheaper. They have you know, a temperature sensor, an accelerometer, you've got a switch that's built in, and you have a LED on it. And then the more advanced version, like the top of the one, they have one mid one that has a couple of extra sensors, and the top of the line one has a gyroscope, a basically pressure sensor, which is, you know, an altimeter sensor, 
and it has a light ambient light sensor and a second temperature sensor on it. So in this small little package, you have a lot of stuff, especially when you're comparing that to something like an Arduino or whatever else like that. You have built-in support for rechargeable batteries, which is another thing where when you're working with rechargeable batteries, you have to actually integrate in another circuit for that with a lot of these Arduino-based solutions so you don't overcharge and do things like that with it. Some specs. Um, Nordic semiconductor chipset for those. Anybody, now nobody here is an double E, so probably doesn't mean that much. 2.4 gigahertz transceiver, so, which is pretty much, that's Bluetooth LE. An ARM Cortex M0 processor, so it's a low powered processor, but you don't need to have a lot. Um, 256 kilo, <coughs> kilobytes of flash, 16K of RAM, and then the 89.10 80C. Mother specs. Um, Base unit has the accelerometer, temperature sensor, push button switch, red LED, oh yeah, and a driver for a vibration motor or and or a buzzer. And they're micro USB chargeable, but you can't program them with a, a USB connection. You program them wirelessly or via some special pinning and stuff like that, getting into ARM firmware development, which probably most of us here wouldn't do. Um, and it does have support for I2C bus, four digital analog ports and four digital pins. So you can do, it's got a decent amount of inputs that you can use with this device again. All right, what are the cons? Anybody here watch Star Trek? <laughs> a few. Of course, that's the original too. It's not even the next generation. All right, um, cons. It's, it is really small. Now, overall, I think that's a positive, but how many people here are good at soldering? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, how many people are good at soldering with a microscope? Because <laughs> that's usually what you have to do with this. You almost, either a microscope or a magnifying glass. You have to be really good with this because these, the little pins that you're going to solder into to get connectivity are small. Um, they're talking about actually coming up with a version that will have like headers on it that could adapt over when you're just prototyping. Um, it's tough to write custom drivers unless you know how to do ARM firmware engineering. Um, so it is a little bit, it is on the proprietary side. They're fairly open with their API. They're happy to have you integrate with it. They will let you put your own firmware on the device, but they're not going to let you have access to their firmware code. That's where they draw the line. So briefly, let's talk a little bit about Bluetooth since we're going to be working in that. Um, so how many people here have ever like kind of looked at all how Bluetooth works under the hood at all? So a little bit, okay. So what is Bluetooth? We hear about it all the time. Well, it's basically you're using the same frequency range as um, 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi. It actually it shares that same frequency range as far as when you're using a Bluetooth device. Big difference is, is you have 79 channels versus 13 when you're working with these Bluetooth devices. So basically, where Wi-Fi has like, what, 13 channels in, the, in that space, they've chopped it up into 79. The result of that is you're going to get usually less throughput. Not even usually, you always are with Bluetooth in the current stacks they have with that. All right, so then what is Bluetooth LE? Now, how many people here have heard of Bluetooth LE? Okay, so everybody's heard of Bluetooth LE. Well, what is it? Well, the one big difference is, is that Bluetooth LE, it's part of the 4.0 spec. It's always off versus the other Bluetooth, the, you know, the previous generations, they were basically, they tend to be on a bit more, so they consume more power. It generally has less throughput because it doesn't use as sophisticated of a compression algorithm to compress data that's sent over it because it's meant for small, it's not meant to be like something where you're going to send gobs of data over it and tether your phone to it or something else like that. It's meant for small devices that just need to get small amounts of data back and forth. Um, they often transmit at lower power <coughs> ranges, however, they don't have to per se, but they do. And again, designed for low power, low you know, low data, low power types of applications. So to give you an idea, this is like, basically this is how the frequency band might look right now for 2.4 gigahertz. And then if you were to compare that with, you know, Bluetooth, you have like all these separate channels in there. And quite often they'll also use something called spread spectrum technology where they're, you're literally, basically, it's constantly going, switching channels as it's, um, basically communicating with the device. And that's one of the reasons why you can have a room that's fairly saturated with a lot of Wi-Fi connections and still have your Bluetooth devices work. That doesn't need as much of a slice with it, too. Okay, so to use these devices, so the metawares are Bluetooth 
LE devices, that's all they work on. They don't communicate with the older stacks and they don't basically use Wi-Fi or anything like that. So if you want to work with a metaware and you're working with a mobile device, um, now obviously the laptops come to play too, but generally speaking, I think mobile is a way to develop with these. You're going to use either an iPad third generation or better iPhone 4S or greater, or if you're on Android, you're going to need to find a device that has Bluetooth, a Bluetooth 4.0 supported radio, and Android 4.3 or greater. And I would probably recommend that you go with at least 4.4 or better yet 5 if you can, because that's where the 4, basically 4.3 was rough for Bluetooth LE, 4.4 got reasonably decent, reasonably good. And then 5.0 is like where things actually started to become a first-class citizen with it. Now, to give you an idea with that one too, what kind of devices you're talking about? Um, if you've got a flagship phone back in like late 2011, you probably have Bluetooth 4.0 support. For example, the Galaxy Nexus has it. Um, the Nexus 10 can be hacked in to get it. The Nexus 7 2013 definitely has it. Um, most modern phones that you buy today actually have that support. I mean, and to kind of put this in perspective, about a year ago, I bought a bunch of burner phones for another project, paid on Black Friday specials between, was it 20 and $30, and basically they all supported Android 4.4 and had Bluetooth 4.0 radios. So you can get them pretty cheap, is the point. Right, so the tools we're going to use here, um, we're going to do our demos in Android, because I just like Android, and plus, this framework that I'm going to demonstrate in this Cordova plugin that I'm going to show you is something that it's very much a work in progress at this point, and so we're in the early days of it, but I want to demonstrate it to show you that you can start using JavaScript now and not have to do mobile native development to work with these boards. We're going to use Cordova. How many people here have heard of Cordova before? Okay, so pretty much everybody. So as you probably know, it uses a web view. It's a technology that basically allows you to use a web view to develop mobile apps. You can deploy and package them. But more importantly, you have access to the sensors on the phone, and you can write plugins to access native APIs, which is what we do with it. And you don't have to learn native development, which is kind of cool. But the plugins, that's the real benefit. We're also, hopefully if we get time, we'll, do, we'll dive just deep, briefly into NativeScript just to show you how you could use it with NativeScript too. Anybody here heard of NativeScript before? Okay, so a few people. What's cool about NativeScript is it's kind of, it's the same type of, like Cordova, all of your JavaScript is, is still being executed as JavaScript with NativeScript, but instead of using a web view, it basically, you have your own XML type of thing where you, in, at the end of the day, basically, you use native components, which is kind of cool. So you get a better experience. It's more nat it's more of a native style experience. If you're on an Android device, you're using Android widgets. If you're on an iOS device, you're using iOS widgets. So you're not dealing with um, basically trying to re render in the web view and make it look like one or the other or having a weird experience. OK, so let's start a little demo <coughs> now with the metaware. All right, so let me get over to our camera here. Okay, and I probably want to turn, actually no, we just, we'll just bring this up like this. So before we actually start doing some coding, let's just briefly go through just a quick demo of how some of the functionality and the things that we can do with these cool little boards. So I'm going to bring out our ambient app here. Okay, and as you can see, I've got two devices here, because actually right now I've got two MetaWare devices with me today. And this one happens to be closer. And this is the latest model that has like all the sensors on it and stuff like that. All right, so we're just going to connect up into it. And now you can see we've got it here, and we've got some information. And is this big enough, or should I make this a little bit bigger for everybody here? All right. Actually, though, you know what? Let me just make that slightly bigger. And let me just make that. There's nothing that's worse than being in a presentation and having to squint. There we go. Let's see if that's a little bit better. That's about as big as I'm probably going to get it on this camera right now. OK, so we're in, we're in basically the interface here. And we're playing around with um, 
We've got, we're connected to this device right here. So what are kind of some of the things that you can do just out of the box? And this is kind of fun just to play around, make sure your device is working, and also get a feel of some of the things that you can do just out of the box. Well, I mean, we can obviously get an LED on here. So if you look right there, we can turn that on. I can turn it on red. I can flash it. Turn it on blue, right? Do some stuff like that. Pretty basic stuff. Probably you wouldn't want to just use, it'd be kind of a bit of money to spend to just be able to control an LED with your phone. No, but then again, no, no. <laughs> um, so we've got our temperature sensors here. So I just basically, I've hit this right there to get a reading. We've got a couple of them here. So if I read that temperature, so there's like an internal one and there's an external one. And I'll be honest with you, I haven't played that much with this new one yet, but there's, Basically, the idea is, and then you can, it has support on there for another external channel that, or if you wanted to attach a more accurate sensor or something else like that, you could as well. And probably, now granted, I'm used to reading freedom units more than I am Celsius, but it looks like that may be close to accurate, maybe, but it may be a little bit off. It's one thing I've noticed with that, where I think you need to do a little bit of calibration with it. Um, so you have an accelerometer on here. So if you look, if we just start streaming this right here. So if we move our device, Right, so you have basically, you know, so it's all just built in. Um, you've got tap detection. I'm not going to demo that there because it's kind of, it, that is, at times that actually is a little bit flaky. But what's kind of cool here is you've got basically flat detection where it'll detect if the device is flat or not. I wonder if that's actually going to work or not. Looks like it's not. Stop that and try it again. Yeah, there's a bug in their software. Okay. Orientation detection. So that's kind of cool. See, so it'll tell you if it's portrait landscape. And again, this is the, all these things are just things you can get at via the API. Uh, what else can we do with this? Okay, here's our gyroscope. So let's stream our gyro, gyro, gyroscope just for fun. These are kind of fun to play with. It's it's fun to play with your accelerometer versus your gyroscope to see the difference with how, like if you go up and down, right, versus side to side, it can actually, it's much more precise as far as, oh yeah, it's going the one way or the other way, which is kind of cool with that too. And that's part of the reason why you might put it on there, where you can do, you can actually create a step counter using just an accelerometer, but you can actually do a bit more and tell a bit more about what's happening with the motion when you also have a gyroscope that's built in as well with that. So that's kind of cool. Um, has anybody here played with some of these sensors before, either in your Android device or something like that? Or no? Okay, okay so a couple of people have. And if you wanted to even just through this application, you want to debug something, you can also hook stuff up to the pins, which I'm not going to do here today, and then actually get at them and test them and see if you're, you know, what kind of values are you getting back before right going into your software, and it's also a way to debug it. Um, what else? So yeah, here's the little haptic buzzer thing. So if I just hit this right here with the haptic driver, see how it just went down because basically it just buzzed. <laughs> Just write an app to buzz it all the time. That could be kind of fun. <laughs> um, you can also, that's the other cool thing, you can turn these into beacons if you want to as well. You Right now, out of the box, say it has support for the iBeacon, and in, I think, I forget if it's the latest API or not, they're going to be, they don't have it already, it's going to be in very shortly, they're going to have support where you can make it look like an Eddystone beacon as well, which is kind of cool. So, um, how many people here have worked at all with beacons or, you know, heard any... That much about it. Okay, so a few, yeah. So that's kind of cool. It's going to support the Eddy Stone as well because the Apple format is proprietary. Though thanks to Radius Networks, we can't get at it in Android, luckily. Uh, what else? We've got an altimeter. So I'm not sh sure how we're going to test that here, but you could basically, with that again, you can detect your altitude on an application or something like that. And what else? Oh yeah, and then it also, here's your light sensor. So right now we've got, it's fairly bright. We cover it up, my hand like that. It basically, it's got nothing because it's dark. Comes back. All right, so a lot of cool things we can get at. All right, now, but the fun part, as JavaScript developers now, how do we access all this stuff and do something interesting with it? Okay, that's where we dig out our friend Cordova. Okay, so... How many people here have done something with um, PhoneGap slash Cordova? Okay, so some people here. For those who haven't, um, 
in essence, to get an application going, and I'm going to basically preempt this by basically not live coding some of this, only because of the fact that I will make a lot of mistakes and we'll be here for another hour <laughs> if that happens. Um, so let's just get ourselves in a state here. So I've tagged up a repo, get checkout, and let's go to our initial state. Okay. So to get an application going and to basically start to develop something with this one, currently the plugin as it stands today is only supporting Android. That will be changing shortly. And if anybody here happens to have done, has anybody here ever done Cordova plugin development? No. Okay. If anybody here, does anybody here do native development by any chance? Okay, so a few. If anybody here is interested in playing around with Metawares and they also want to actually contribute back to helping to develop this uh, plugin further, come see me. I'd love to have help with this one. Otherwise, eventually I'll probably I'll get around to it too. But we're basically this is a work in progress um, of basically wrapping these APIs into a, <coughs> a Cordova plugin so that you can access all of this. And so I'm going to show you a demo of some of the functionality that we currently have. And obviously, there's a lot of stuff that we could continue to do beyond this. Now, for those that haven't done Cordova, basically, if you were to create this project from scratch, which I'm, I just have up already, you'd be doing, you'd install the Cordova via the NPM and all that stuff. Um, you would do NPM, um, in, <coughs> basically NPM, or sorry, Cordova create the project, Cordova install plugin, and you would do a reference to the plugin, which you would find on the re repo up in GitHub, which is under Ambient Lab Projects, right here. And this, um, basically, and from there it brings it down, installs it in your project, and then you would do a Cordova ad platform, Android, and you would end up with something that looks an awful lot like this. And for these examples, we're just going to make this very simple, and we're going to do everything just out of our index.html file. Um, I have added one other thing. After you install the plugin, you have to basically reference the JavaScript file for the plugin so it can start to reach into the Jenny interface and all that. So I've included device.js. OK. So how do we connect to the? Let's start by doing some basics, by, which happen to be connecting to the board. So I'm just going to quickly check out here my code for that. OK. And then let's go ahead also and install that on our device here. Allow debugging, yes. And, okay, so I'm going to install this on the device and give you a demo and then walk you through how we're doing this. And so to install this on our phone, we're going to do Cordova. Uh, what is it? Run Android. It's going to take a second. Let's see how long it takes. It sh actually should be fairly quick. And then if I bring up the camera for our device here, so you can see what's going on. And the other thing with this too is that when you're working, when you're prototyping these, these applications, one thing that's a little annoying but not incredibly bad is that you're basically, uh oh, it's got a bad, oh, my connection's going funky because I moved my cord. No, no. You get out of the way. There we go. So that cable's a little bit funky, but that should work for a thing. Okay. So at any rate, um, when you're developing applications that work with this one, because you have to access the Bluetooth radio, Bluetooth device on the device, Bluetooth radio on the device, you can't really use the uh, simulators, and so you pretty much have to have a lot of device to test on. Now the good news with that is then you don't have to deal with all the memory overhead of the basically iOS or the Android um, simulator, but the negative is obviously you have to be on a device. So our code that we're using here currently is basically just doing something very simple. It's just going to connect to our MetaWare device, which happens to be this one right here. I just, which by the way, this is just basically, it's a, one of these boards in a printed case that I've done. Okay, and if everything is working the way we would hope it would, if I hit this connect button here, it's going to think for a minute, do some stuff, and then hopefully the demo gods are happy today. It is going to connect. And let's see what's going on. And we got an error with the 
with the radio, which is a very common thing. Whenever you're doing live demos, right, you get some little problems and glitches here or there. So let me see. So one of the first things I usually do, by the way, when you're debugging anything that's communicating with a Bluetooth LE device is that if, you, if it thinks it's still connected to something else, it'll have trouble. It basically, you can't connect another application to it. You can only have one device connected to one board at a time over Bluetooth LE. And so one way to make sure that it's my, all of my programs on this device have basically released that connection is to just disable the radio for a minute because then it just, everything kind of nicely resets itself. So I'm just disabling my radio for a minute, re-enabling that, and let's try to connect again and see what it does. Come on there. And let's see if we get a good live demo. I do know we can actually see it. And something definitely, we are definitely getting some errors with the radio. So let me try something else here. Let me just put this really quick in airplane mode. We're getting the demo gods now, which we're hitting with that one. Okay, so one minute. Try this again. Worst case scenario is I can reset the board, which sometimes that'll work as well. Okay, so I'm going to connect over here again after it. And let's see if it likes it or if we get an error with it. For our demo, we are still getting an error. So let me just try something really quick. Let me make sure our board is working correctly. So how many people run into nice, pro fun problems like this when you're basically demoing hardware or working with hardware? Well, that's a good point. Right? Yeah, that's a fair point. All right, that is a fair point. So I'm just going to connect to the board really quick and see what is going on as far as if it can actually connect to this device or not. Because something is definitely having an issue. Actually, what I'm doing right now is I'm just making sure that we can still connect to it. So it's definitely timing out. So I'm going to put this phone in airplane mode for a minute. Let me show you what I'm doing. And actually, let's just take this over here. Okay, and we're going to try to connect to it again. I know it's this one because you can see here that's a really strong signal. Let's try to connect. Now the worst case is that we can actually just, we'll switch boards that we use. That's actually the good news. Okay, so something that still doesn't like connecting to this board for whatever reason. However, we were able to connect to this board, so we're going to do something kind of, we're going to basically quickly switch out our example here. Okay. So, in our example code, I have hard-coded, basically, with Bluetooth, you have a MAC address for any device that you're, that you're using with it. Something with that cord, it really doesn't like. Okay. It is not happy with that. Let me see there if that... Okay. Whoa. All right. We have a bad connection here. Okay. So one other problem here, too. You can rehearse everything, and then you run into a weird hardware issue. Let's see here. Okay. Pull this. <laughs> And let's try a different cord and a different port on my hub. Okay, that looks like it's got a better connection. So let's try that. Okay, it's happy there. It looks like it's happier. Cool. Okay. So what I'm going to do is this now. So for whatever reason, we're having trouble connecting to this board. And in the code I'm going to show you in just a minute, we're going to have to have a MAC address for that board to be able to basically, for whatever board we want to connect to, to do our examples with. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go into, and the MAC addresses are different on an iOS device versus an Android device. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go into a MetaWare app that basically comes on the Android device here. And we are going to, there it is. And I'm just going to scan for this device so that, There we go. Actually, you know what the problem may have been? I wonder if that app thought it was still connected. Let me just try one other thing here really quick. And close that. One more time, let's try connecting. There is that. That was our problem. Okay. 
So I had the Metaware app running on my Android device, and because of that, it had been connected to this one. So every time the radio was up, it was connecting to this, and then another device was. <laughs> All part of the fun of when you're basically you're hacking it with Bluetooth. Okay, so that was our demo that was initially we were trying to do. We are basically we're trying to connect to our board um, with it, and that's what it does. Basically, we hit the button, and it connects. Okay, so how do we, how do we implement that now in our JavaScript code? All right, if we look down here, um, in our HT, basically we put a little bit of HTML in here to basically, here's a little connection status text thing, and there's a button. And this button is calling a method that we call initialize connect. All right, now up here what we're doing, now let me explain what we're doing here. Right now the way the API is currently designed, you have to initialize a metaware service before you can start and make sure that that's successful before you can start issuing commands like even to connect to the board. That may get changed later on, but that's currently the way that we're implementing this. And so because of that, when you're doing a connection, I didn't want to take and have a separate button to say go initialize and then do this. And so I've added a little bit of state. And so in essence, what we've done is we've said, okay, set the initialize state for a board to false. We just have a reference here to the MAC address of the board. And then if it's not initialized, what we're going to do first is we're going to call this initialize method here. We're going to pass it a success callback, which is the initialize callback, or an error callback if we have a problem, which is what we were getting before where it was like basically trying, actually I think it was initializing, but then it was just basically giving us an error because we had a problem with um, connection. Okay, so providing the initialization is successful, we end up down here. And by the way, can everybody read this okay? Is this readable? Okay, cool. Um, then we say, okay, initialize is true, right? Pretty obvious. But more importantly, we then connect to the board. We pass in when we connect, that's when we pass in the MAC address to say, we want to connect to the board with this MAC address, and we pass it a success callback or an error callback. Pretty standard stuff. The callback structure for pretty much everything that you work with in this API, and pretty much for the most part, this is a pretty standard Cordova thing, is it's a function that has one variable that is called result. A result basically can have, depending on how things are implemented in the method you're calling, it can either return you a string, an integer, I think a float, um, and it can do an array of JSON objects or a JSON object. We are currently using strings for some and JSON objects for others, and that will be changing over time, and that's all in the documentation. All right, but at any rate, so for the connection, we're just passing back a string, and as you can see there, it basically just says, yay, we've got an alert that says status connected, and we change our text, and life is good. Okay, so pretty basic stuff. So let's read some information from one of our sensors, like, well, actually, let's start by reading just the, how strong the signal is between our device and our metaware. So what we're going to do here now, let me just grab the code, back out, and then our SSI, it should be the tag for that. Yes, okay. And let's go ahead and install that code on our device. So we have our stuff running correctly. Okay, and while that's installing, um, oh, there we go. It's going actually nice and fast. Let's bring up our camera. A little demo. What? There we go. Let me reset the camera really quick here. There we go. So now that's happy again. Let me just quickly zoom that back in. This is always the case, right? You rehearse your talk, and then you have the demo gods, which like to hit you. Okay. Okay, so what have we done with this new code now? We basically, okay, we have the connect functionality that we had before, and we need to connect to our board before we can do anything. So let's just initiate that and hope that it's happier this time than it was before. And it is. It's connected, which is good. Get that away. And then... We click our get our SSI, and we're going to get a value for it, which is basically the signal strength between the device and the other, and the phone. And if I bring things over here, you can see, oh yeah, it's not as strong, right? It's a 73 versus, now it should get strong. 
41, right, because it's closer. That's the general idea behind it. Okay, so how do we do that? How did we just access these sensors on this board? Well, of course, we added a button down here, pretty standard JavaScript again. And in this case, because we don't, we're not managing any state, we've just basically put in a simple on-click to basically go into the API interface, which is accessed through Metaware, MW device, and then all the methods hang off of that right now. We just say read the RSSI, give it a success callback and an error callback. And our success callback is just basically painting that text in. So simple stuff, pretty easy, but again, not that much work and you can start integrate, basically interacting with these boards without having to do some crazy stuff with APIs and all that. Okay, so let's do something a little bit more interesting now. And let's read some stuff off the accelerometer. So, and it should be start. Cool. And then let's go ahead now and install that on our device again. Takes just one second, there we go. And now we've got, basically we've added a button here, and now let me bring up the camera so you can see it. So we've added a button here for star accelerometer. And basically, so we do our standard thing again, let's connect to our board first, and it connects. And look, it's really happy now, I don't have the other application connecting with the board. Um, and let's start our accelerometer here. Um, so we hit that, start accelerometer, and you can see it's actually streaming data now from the accelerometer on the board. And look, see if I go like that, the values start to get bigger, kind of, and it's doing it so fast, so they're, they're, they bounce all over the place. And I've also not put any filters on there, so it's basically any noise even in the device, it, it, it still, you can see it's getting these weird values and things like that, which is kind of normal. Normally you put a filter on there or something else like that, but again, shake it, look, it's doing stuff. All right, so how did we implement that? How do we get that? All right, so we look at our code here. We've added our accelerometer button, and we've added a call. Of course, we have our text field, and we've added a call to basically the start accelerometer function. Right, and we've given ourselves now a callback for the accelerometer, and in this case, though, what we're doing is instead of just getting a string value back, the accelerometer can have an x value, a y value, and a z, a z value. And so basically, every single time it calls it back, which basically the um, plugin is calling it back whenever it gets another string value from the board, it's just going through, passing it through the result, and then we put it in a string and we print it out, and thus we're getting this stuff streamed into the board. Okay, so fairly simple standard stuff. Um, now to finish off our application, let's take and actually write some code that would allow us to stop that accelerometer. So let's just... Okay, so now we're at our stop accelerometer. I'll go ahead and deploy that off to our board. And this one probably, because it's in a streaming mode, even though it's gonna install a new version of the app and kind of break the connection, I probably will have to shut off the Bluetooth radio before it connects successfully is my guess. We'll see, let's give it a minute. And <coughs> we're installed again, and let's see if it connects without me having to reset the radio. And it's probably gonna error out. So what I, prob what I will have to do really quick is, let me just shut off the Bluetooth radio. It'll probably say disconnected, yep. Let's turn that back on. There we go, we're connected now. And let's connect again. And now we're connected, okay. So, and then what we're adding here is we're gonna add a stop thing. So if we hit our button, it'll say start accelerometer. And something, this has done this before with this code for whatever reason. There we go. So I have to start it once, stop it once, and then do it again. Then it seems to get the values right. Okay, now I'm gonna, there's a bug somewhere there. But the big thing is, not only can we start it, but we can stop our accelerometer, which would be a good thing because we don't necessarily want to be constantly streaming data. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, we basically, we've added, now we call into this, me this method called start stop. And if we look at start stop here, 
in essence, we've added some state. There's a, there's, a, there's a state called stopped and there's a state called started for the accelerometer. And if it's stopped, we're going to do our standard logic that we had before to basically say start it, set some text in the button, do all that. And if it's stopped, or sorry, if it's in a started state, we're going to just call stop accelerometer with no callbacks. We assume that those are always successful. And it stops it. Disconnect would be kind of similar. And that kind of, that's basically, you know, in a nutshell, it's kind of some very basic examples of how you would use this Cordova plugin with it. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about native script. So with native script, you, there's not a mechanism that I'm aware of right now for using a Cordova plugin in it. Um, I was going to do an example with React uh, Native, but I'll be honest with you, it's not quite baked enough. And I'm kind of holding out because there is some work that's happening to allow you to basically use Cordova plugins in React Native. And I'm really, there, the, the guy started some work on that project. It looks promising, but it doesn't look like it's quite there yet. But I'm really hoping that that's the case because as much as I don't have a problem necessarily developing another thing for React Native, I really prefer not to have to support three different sets of libraries for three different sets of frameworks on <laughs> mobile, even though I do like to support the thing they're doing. But, so let's look at, let's look though at native script briefly. Okay, how many people here have done anything with native script again? A few? Okay, so a couple. Um, right, and how many people here have done any Android development? Okay. So this is what's cool. What's cool about this is I didn't want to develop a plugin or anything else for this. But what's cool about React Native is, unlike Cordova, we have to develop a plugin to get at native API things in the API. With Native Script, you can actually reach into the native APIs when you need when you want to do something just in your application. Now there are pros and cons to that, but it allows you to still write JavaScript, have a little bit more of an expressive language, but yet reach in there. So let me just show you a quick demo of the application. And this is a very dead, simple application that I'm running here. OK. So I've just written something that's just connecting to the board. That's all it's doing. Let me just shut down this piece here. Let me just bring up the app. I'm not going to do a live deploy because we're getting close on time. And if we bring that up right there, Take it a minute to load. So, and let me actually show you, of course, the camera. Or else you're going to be sitting there going, why is he on his phone showing me stuff and the other? All right, and so I literally just took the kitchen sink app here, and I just basically added a connect and disconnect. I didn't even bother to take the tap off of this um, that they normally give you. Because when you do it in the standard, like, you're creating an application, they just give you a tap button, right? And it'll sit there. Look, I've got taps left. So I've created something here just to show proof of concept. This will connect to the device. And so if you watch, there it is. It says it's connected. And if we look at the log files, we'll actually see it is connected. And I could bring up ADB with it. But let's look at some code instead, because that's the interesting piece with it. OK, so for all of you people like myself that basically are masochists that actually don't well, are willing to still program in Java, um, you basically um, with this, you have to be able to read the other API and understand the life cycle of Android applications and things like that to work with React Native, or sorry, um, to work with um, Native Script. Okay, and so a Native Script application, when you work with it, you have, ah. all right, so we have basically a main page. Instead of a view that we would normally work with in Cordova, you have this thing called basically, and it could be called main page or something else like that. that is in essence, it's an XML layout for how your display is going to is going to look, which is kind of like somewhere in between, like maybe how Android does it and how HTML does it is the best way to describe it. I haven't used Accelerator, but it could be even related to that. And the idea with this is that in essence, and what's really cool about this right out of the box is, unlike uh, Cordova, where you'd have to basically put something like Angular on top of it, they just give you out of the box. You're using handlebars to bind in method calls and data inside of that, which is kind of cool. So then you have this thing called app, which kind of kicks off everything else inside of your application here. And this is where life gets interesting, OK? If you were doing straight Android development for the Metawares, which is actually something I'm going to be doing a course at AndevCon out in um, 
what is it, uh, San Jose in December on this, and then also I'll probably do one locally at some point. Um, you basically would need to bind in, to use the, the thing in Java, to use the interface or the API in Java, they in essence have implemented the API in basically a service and you have to bind that service to your main activity in your application so then you can start to do things with it. But through native script, they actually give you hooks. So in essence, you can, first of all, you can create, like for example, I'm creating a service, an Android service connection object right here. But notice I'm writing JavaScript to do this. I'm getting a reference to it here. And in that service connection, I'm overriding, and I don't even have to put override in there. I just basically implement this method to say, when the service is connected, do something. There's our on disconnected here. And then from here, they basically give us hooks in so we can basically do application Android, which is basically a hook into the callbacks in our main activity. And then on the application Android application activity created event. So we have events that happen in Android. You know, there's basically on created, on um, start, on started, on view created, different things like that. But in that event, we say, get our application context and then bind the service in, which is normally what we would have to do if we're writing an Android application. But we're writing JavaScript for it. We're not having to write a plugin or something else like that. And we can just put it in native script and then just include the API. Then what we do is the majority of your logic for different views are attached to a model. Again, I'm a beginner at native script, so I will say that it, it, this, this may not be the best style with it, but the idea was to show that you can get at this and do some interesting things with some of these hybrids, because we tend to do more probably straight native development than not. Okay, so I'm gonna go past their hello world code and all that, but then in your connect right here, this is literally just taking the Java code that you would normally use again, and you'd have to do the same thing for iOS, but I'm just taking the Java code, converting it to the syntax that I would use, that native script would use to basically interpret, this is a Java call, now it's gonna go ahead and cross transpile, and here you go. Connect, you basically have a connect function, and in your connect function you're saying, okay, I need to get at the system service, get the Bluetooth device manager, bind the Bluetooth manager to my actual device, which is basically just passing it in a string uh, with the, um, MAC address of the device, and then from there I can ba I can basically I create a handler, which is all part of the middleware API that basically is a connection state with callbacks for if it's if you're connected, disconnected, or if you failed. And then um, once I have that, I basically create a, an instance of that, and you can read all this in the docs as far as how you have to actually write your native script code to be able to. To, to mimic what you'd be writing in your Java, and then basically from there, I set my handler on the board and then connect to the board, and voila, we've basically connected the board and we're doing cool things with it. So, we're, just, we're pretty much at time here, but I think the big point is with this, with all of this is that, yes, you can use JavaScript to prototype wearables, uh, the MetaWare board is beginning to offer more JavaScript support with it. It's very much under active development, and there's some new, interesting, exciting things that are happening with it. And um, if you're interested in playing around with it, definitely come talk to me at some point. There, um, I can help hook you up with boards and things like that, and also um, answer any questions about development on them. And also, if anybody here is into... So, was anybody here... How many people here were the cat people? Okay. And do you also per program? I've got t-shirts. <laughs> so, just like this. <laughs> and that's it. Any qu oh, any questions, by the way, too? No questions. Man, you guys are quiet. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> oh. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So let's um hang on a second here. What size are you? Large. Large? All right. Yeah, definitely. How much did you say one of those? 
Depends on which board you get.